Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Let's start the session with uh, paying homage to the Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sanma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sanma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sanma Sambuddhasa this morning, we are fortunate to have Dr. Ng Yen Yen with us to talk about one fortunate attachment, Majima Nikaya 131 to 134. Dr. Ng? Okay. Good morning. So today's topic is about one fortunate attachment. Majima Nikaya 131 to 134. So one fortunate attachment. The Buddha in all, most of his discourses will say that attachment brings you grief. Attachment to your wife, to your children, to your cows, the oxen, to things, uh, he says will bring you grief and will bring you fear. So without all this, he says, without any attachment, there is no grief and there is no fear. So then what is this attachment that he tells us to be? And if we are attached to this, we will be fortunate and not be unfortunate. So we go into this sutta, which is one attachment, and actually in the Majima Nikaya, it spans over four suttas. So we talk about the place and the people involved. In 131, it was at Jetavana, Buddha spoke this uh, is caused to his bhikkhus. In the second, it's also Jetavana, and it is Venerable Ananda exalted the monks with this sutta. And the Buddha was very pleased that Venerable Ananda spoke this discourse to the bhikkhus. And 133, it was at Raja Gaha. And it was Venerable Samidi who, on the persuasion of a Deva, asked the Buddha, what is this one fortunate attachment? And after the Buddha had given him these stances, he sort of didn't know what it means. And he then asked Venerable Mahakachana, to explain. Then the fourth is at Jetavana, and it is Venerable Lomasagya, and he, on persuasion of this Deva called Kendana, who dana him this stanza, and the Venerable Loma went to the Buddha and told him that the Deva spoke of this one fortunate attachment. And it's also said that in this particular sutta, the Buddha had discussed this one fortunate attachment to the devas of the Tavatimsa. So this sutta is a sutta for men and for gods. So now we see what is the sutta all about. So this sutta has four stanzas. Okay. So the first one is, let not a person revive the past, nor in the future build his hopes. For the past has gone, and the future has not come. Then instead, with insight, let him see each presently a reason state. Let him know and be sure, invincibly, unshakably. So he knows the present. Today the effort must be made. Tomorrow death may come. No bargaining with mortality can keep him and his thoughts away. And then the last. But one who dwells ardently 
relentlessly, by day and by night, it is he, the Buddha says, who has one fortunate attachment. Okay, so now you know about this four, we will then elaborate. So, the main sutta, 131 and 133, and we will go into this first part that was explained by the Buddha. Now, the Buddha says that we should not revive the past. And of the past, what is it that he said not to revive? He says, do not revive and delight in the form, in the feelings, in the perceptions, in the mental formations and the consciousness of the past. So, he, he talked about the five aggregates. He talked about the five aggregates because when you delight, when you delight in the five aggregates of the past, then you are caught up in the past. And if you delight, says in the future, I will be such, with such a body, or I'll be reborn in such a state, in a particular realm I like to be in, then you would have this aggregates of the body, the feeling, the perception, the mental formation, and the consciousness about it in the future. So, he says then you will be caught up in the past and you'll be caught up in the future and you're not living in the present. So, he emphasized the past has gone, the future has not come. Why do you get caught up with these five aggregates? When you get caught up with five aggregates because you think these five aggregates as the self, as permanent, so you get caught up in them. As these five aggregates are in yourself, you get caught up in them. Or that this self is the five aggregates, or this self is in the five aggregates. That's why you get caught up in them. So this is what the Buddha say, that do not get caught up with the five aggregates of the past, nor hope of some past aggregates or hope for some future aggregates in the future, then you, your time will be wasted in the past and in the future. So this is how the Buddha explained this first stanza. So he explained this first stanza with the five aggregates. Then, how did Mahakachana explain this stanza to Venerable Samidhi? Venerable Samidhi asked the Buddha, what is this unfortunate attachment? And after the Buddha gave these stanzas, Buddha got up and left. And then he didn't know the meaning of it. So when he asked Venerable Mahakachana, Mahakachana says, you saw the hard wood, the Buddha. Why didn't you ask him? He will be able to explain to you. But he says that, I think sometimes the monks get in awe of the Buddha and they forgot to ask for an explanation. So then, Venerable Samidhi pleaded with Mahakachana, please, you are foremost in the exposition. So can you tell me the meaning? So Mahakachana then says, he says that your consciousness, your consciousness, should not be entangled with the eye and its form of the past. See, last time my eyes are such, I see such things, I went to such places, you know, I see such things, so you yearn to see such things again. 
or my ears have heard some song, some music of the past and I yearn to hear those again and then you think about them or your smell, your nose and its smell, the tongue and its taste, the body and its touch, the mind and its thoughts. So then you, your consciousness is engaged with the sixth sense base internally and externally. Then you are get caught up in them. So this consciousness is involved with the sixth sense base internal and external. So this is how he explained it. So that you delight in the sixth sense basis internal and external of the past and, uh, and you hope that you will have something, some of the sixth sense base internal and external for the future. So then when you delight and indulge in the five aggregates and the sixth sense base, you are caught in the past and in the uh, future. And when you are caught, then the Buddha says that of the four noble truths, you are caught up with suffering. So how you get caught up with suffering? So the four noble truths is suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation and the path. So this is the origin. This is the origin of the suffering. So when you are caught up with this, uh, you are suffering. You will be suffering because that's the origin of suffering. And he explained it in the Four Noble Truths. In the sense, uh, Four Noble Truths, the origin. And he explains it in the 12 D.O. Because there is ignorance, so your volition to your consciousness, to your mind body, to your sixth sense base, to your contact, to your feeling, perception, mental formation, the five aggregates. Then the craving, clinging, becoming, birth, and a whole lot of suffering. So you have bad, sad, and clinging to the five aggregates. So when you contact when you think about the past, you contact through your sixth sense base, your mind. Okay, so you contact. So how do you contact? You have to use your consciousness to contact together with this sixth sense base, external and internal. Contact to give you the feelings. The feeling, this contact gives you the feeling, the five aggregates of the body, the feeling, the perception, the mental formations. So, in every contact, there is the five aggregates. So, your consciousness is get sort of entangled with the sixth sense base to then go into this domino effect of having, becoming and suffering. Birth, aging, disease, death, sadness, agitation, despair and depression. In other words, clinging on to the five aggregates. So it tells you of the Four Noble Truths that this is suffering. If you do this, if you keep going to the past and you go to the future, you are actually doing this to yourself, causing yourself suffering. Okay. So then he says the next thing. Now how to get out of this suffering? Now instead, with insight, let him see each presently a reason state. 
See, uh, each presently a reason state. Let him know and be sure, invincibly, unshakably. And a reason state is what? What happens? That means it's past already. So you see arising and you see cessation. So when you inside, you see each presently a reason state. Each when you are in the present, you see each a reason state. That means you see any phenomena, any condition arising and ceasing. And you must know. Let him know. Let him see and let him know. And be sure, invincibly, unshakably. So you are invincible. If you are invincible and you see, it, eh? that means you see arising and ceasing. You see every moment, every condition as arising and ceasing. And that you are unshakable about this. Because every moment eh, you see arising and ceasing. Every breath you see arising and ceasing. Every swallow you see arising and ceasing. Every movement you do, you see arising and ceasing. Every walk, every step you uh, walk, you see arise and cease, arise and cease, arise and cease. So in all the moments that you see, in your body, in your feelings, in your perceptions, the mental formations and the consciousness have to arise and cease at every moment of contact. So we are going through an environment that has so many contacts. Our eyes, our nose, our ears, our tongue, our body. So it's like an organism, you know, with the eyes, our eyes, nose, tongue, oh, ears. So that makes it five. Then we may have the body. Whatever lah, huh? the body, and then the mind. This, this organism is passing through an environment and it's always sensing. Right, huh? And now they're asking you to sense uh, that all these contacts uh, are changing, 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 changing. And these five aggregates, five aggregates uh, of the body, feelings, mental formation, perception, consciousness are changing. Your six sense base are changing. So these are changing, changing, changing. All these are changing, changing. So you have to be seen, you have to see it as changing, 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 arising and ceasing. You would be conquered or vanquished if you hang on to something. So he says, if you hang on to the five aggregates, if you delight in it and you hang on, then you are conquered. You are, you are conquered, you are vanquished. You are the prey, right? The predator had gotten you already. So he says, you have to put an effort. You see, so this is what you need to see, that your five aggregates of your body, so the five aggregates of the body, the feelings, the perceptions, the mental formations, and the consciousness are changing, changing, changing. Every contact has a five aggregate, just like we all said, you know. If you now think of your favorite food, you will have the body of the food, the feeling towards the food, the perception that this is the food you like, the mental formations that you think about the food, and then when you feel that there is a delight in it, you get you go and get to you go and get to cook it or get it or something, you know. There is a volition, an intention to go and get this to fulfill your delights. So this 
body, feelings, perception, mental formation, consciousness arise and cease, arise and cease. So if they arise and cease, then he says they are impermanent. Impermanent and that they are suffering. The definition for in, uh, suffering dukkha has three. One is dukkha dukkha te, old age sickness and death. One is dukkha sankara, means it's the mental part of it. All conditioned things are dukkha. The third one is that dukkha parinama, which means as long as there is change, this is called dukkha. So when things are impermanent, it is suffering. And that when there is suffering and impermanent, it is not substantial. There's no essence in it. When something is impermanent, there is no substance. No substance in it. So it is changing all the time. And so if you see that this is of no substance, of no value, would you go for something of no value? Do you want to spend time on things that are of no value? Right, huh? So when you see it, that these are of no substance, they are impermanent, then you would not want to cling. If you do not want to cling, then you are free. So this being, seeing this as impermanent frees you. So because it frees you, it frees you, that's why it is fortunate. It frees you from the suffering. Because it's impermanent. Ma. And of course, you must be dispassionate about it. If you are dispassionate, if you see it and you know that it is impermanent, you won't cling to it. If you still cling to it, then it is ignorance. Or you haven't seen it or penetrate through it properly. So the path itself requires the Noble Eightfold Path. Have the right understanding, the right thoughts, speech, action, livelihood, the right effort, the right mindfulness, and the right concentration. If you walk the path and see it very clearly, you will penetrate through this suffering, then you will have true knowledge and true liberation because you have the right view that this is suffering. So being attached to this, seeing I isn't, I as n, I is nothing, there is no thing here. I is not. So we all say aggregates as self, right? So you don't see it as a self. You don't see I as a substance anymore. So then you let go. So when you let go, you let go and you are free. So to do this, he says, the effort must be made. Tomorrow death may come. So we have this COVID hanging over our heads, right? Huh? And that, so it's no bargaining, it's just the conditions. If you meet one with the COVID and you're not protected with your mask or safe distancing, then you get it, it's the conditions. So no bargaining with mortality can keep mortality and his horse away. So you must put in a lot of effort, the all of effort to do this. So he tells you, he asks you to have put, off, put on uh, a lot of energy. You must endeavor. You must exert. You have to strive. So his last words to us was this, strive. If you don't strive, you can't see. If you cannot keep attention to the present moment, you can't see. So he asks you, please strive. If you don't strive, 
then you will risk the human life because it will be again. It goes again and again. So the samsaric cycle goes again and again. Then the Buddha says, but one who dwells ardently, relentlessly, you know, that means continuously, by day and by night. It is he, the Buddha says, who has one fortunate attachment. If he's attached to seeing uh, all phenomena and seeing all phenomena as impermanent, suffering and no substance. So this is, this is the one fortunate attachment. And these four suttas and lots of devas, you know, enjoy this uh, sutta. And the Buddha discussed this sutta to monks, to uh, humans, as well as for devas. So it is a sutta that it is easy to remember and that you have to sort of uh, again and again to exhort yourself to practice. So this is uh, one fortunate attachment. So you can see here, uh, it relates with the Four Noble Truths, with the three characteristics of existence, with the Dharma. The three characteristics of existence. So Four Noble Truths, three characteristics of existence and dependent origination. The Dharma has always, all discourses have all this in. All discourses have the Four Noble Truths, the Three Characteristics, Existence, and the Twelve D.O. Right. Okay. I would like to share with you some acronym. So it's the past. Right, yeah. So this past, past, previously I used uh, a bit crude, nah? so not very right speech. So I said, put all the shit in the toilet, right? Huh? So now I think I have better speech. Huh? So I say, now we like to put all the past aggregates. and the sixth sense basis, past aggregates and sixth sense basis, internal and external to be flushed, to let go, okay? Eh? To be flushed, we still uh, have uh, association with that previous acronym. So this Past five aggregates, you all the past aggregates five, aggregates five. So it will explain the Buddha's aggregates, five aggregates, and the sixth sense base. So these two main, two main uh, is about, so it tells you, don't be attached to your mind and body, your five aggregates and your sixth sense bases. So, to be flush or to flush, whatever you like. The shorter, the better. So then he tells you, uh, don't go to the future. Don't go to the future. So what is this future? What is this future? So this future is still the five aggregates and the sixth sense base because they are unstable to hold, to cling, to grasp. 
and it's unpleasant because it's dukkha and it's unsafe. So it's really no substance because there's nothing there. If you cling, then you will have endless woes. So the past and the future, don't go there. Then he says, present. Now the present, uh, he always tells us to have the perceptions of isn't or is unstable, unpleasant, no substance. So it is ISN, perceptions of impermanent, suffering and non-substance, isn't, there isn't an I. So this is the right understanding. Foremost, foremost, uh, the four noble truths are foremost of the eightfold noble path. That you have to see things as they are. As they are is this. It isn't. Okay, uh, isn't. And you have to do this uh, energetically. If you then see this, then there will be no thing, nothing. You will see that there's no substance, nothing. Void of self. And then that will be total bliss. Because there's a present, it will be total bliss. If you can see it again and again, you will release yourself from it. So it's total bliss to be in the present. And it is in the present, you see this in the present, then it is the deathless state. So he says that don't go to the past and then uh, don't go to the future, stay in the present. Because he says that the past, all the five aggregates and the sixth sense base are of the Okay, pigs. So the five aggregates, he has said time and again, of the past, the five aggregates are past, present, or future. Internal, the six sense spaces, internal, external, far and near, gross, or subtle, superior or inferior, they are all ISN, isn't. Okay, there's impermanent uh, suffering and uh, non-self. So then he says, this is the nature. So past, present, future, this is their nature to be impermanent, suffering, and non-self. Okay, the sixth sense space is such. Far or near, wherever, may they, if they are gross or subtle, superior or inferior, they are still ISN. And that he says, uh, if you... If you consider... Uh, If you consider the aggregates, aggregates, uh, the five aggregates, body feeling perception as self, as possessing the self, or the aggregates as in self, or the self as the aggregates, uh, 
or the self in aggregates. If you consider this, uh, then uh, he says uh, we will be pigs and ass uh, that comes back again and again to rebirth, to suffering. So we don't want to be pigs and we don't want to be asses. So we want to realize. And to realize, he says, to have this energy to then be in the present, to see the five aggregates and the six sense spaces as impermanent, as suffering, and that there is nothing to hold on. And you cannot hold on because it's impermanent. It's an illusion. It is a magic trick. It's a fake news that you have been holding on since samsara beginning. So he says, see it again and again. Know it. And you see and know it for every moment, then you are free. So this is one fortunate attachment that we can practice again and again in our satipatthana, in our path, in our, you know, to walking on the path, we have to know that this is suffering. To be attached to the five aggregates, the sixth sense base is suffering. We must be kind to ourselves. We must have the right thoughts to renounce this, okay, that is entangled with the taints. Uh, and he says the taints of what? He says the taints of sense pleasures. These taints, sense pleasures, the views and becoming. So these are taints, and taints should be considered as evil that you want to abandon. So he says to abandon this. So when you abandon this sense pleasures, because if you do not abandon, then you are, your consciousness are engaged, intercourse with the sense pleasures, with the views. And then you want this and that in the future. So then you are not in the present. Your inner formation is caught up. You cannot discipline yourself. So you require your discipline to stay in the present. Don't be tucked to the past or pulled to the future. So you must be steady to be in the present, to see each arisen state and be sure of it, that you are not conquered, that you are the master, not the slave and that you use this as a tool and not be used by this. So I think this is one fortunate attachment. I hope you all can uh, use this sutta to practice. You know? So it is an uh, inspirational uh, sutta. So the essence is don't go to the past, don't go to the future, be in the present, and in the present see the state says arising and ceasing, that there's nothing substantial. This state arising is impermanent, has been time. Everything that is subject to arising will subject to cessation too. It is the nature. It is our craving and clinging that brings them into existence. So we have to let go. Let go and don't think that this is the self. But this is a, a gradual shedding. A gradual shedding and then to practice again and again. So we have time for 15 minutes questions. Any questions from the floor? Uh, 
Um, there's one question that came in. Um, in work, we always need to plan for the future. How do we not think about the future? Thanks. Sure, because we are living a lay life. Okay, it is to make your plans, so you must be very clear that this is your work and you have to be clear about the plans. You do up your plans and then that's it. You don't go and sort of like again and again and again uh, sort of be attached to it. You just do up your plans because plans can change. You can plan for your vacation. You know sometimes your vacation doesn't materialize. You plan for your wedding and then oops, there's COVID. You can make plans but you don't sort of get too caught up in it. Just give a general plan that you would like to uh, have for your work. So, and then as you go along, you have to be flexible in changing your plan. But in this, that is your mundane life. But in your spiritual life, you have to have the goal and the vision. Your vision is to see the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And your goal must be that goal. So your vision and goal for your spiritual life because that is the most important. And that this, if you come to rebirth again, that kind of vision and goal will keep you on track on the Noble Eightfold Path. The other path is for livelihood, for your sustenance. You have to uh, do the necessary, but then don't too caught up. And do it with the Noble Eightfold Path in mind. That whatever you plan doesn't cause suffering, to yourself or to others in the society and in the whole ecosystem that you must have the right thoughts in your planning that you are kind and not cruel to yourself and to others you have to have right speech action livelihood in your work and you must put in the effort the mindfulness and the concentration so it doesn't mean uh, that it's separated. The means to an end is still the means matter. The means is very important. If you do not cultivate the means, uh, you can't get the end, the proper end. So it doesn't mean that work is separate from your spiritual life. It is your whole life. It encompasses your whole life. And, but you know that it changes. You need to put in that responsibility. You are paid, so you have to put in that uh, effort as a lay person. So you have to plan, but don't sort of like have too far a plan. Just near future, right? So we know it can one day be here, and the next day be gone. So if you plan so far, it, is, uh, is, it may not materialize. Okay? Thank you, Dr. Ng. Someone would like you to explain the acronym of NS, oh. especially the aggregates as self and the aggregates in self. So if let's say the aggregates the aggregates are said to be the body, the feelings, the perception, mental formation, and consciousness. So this aggregate uh, is nothing but the body and the mind. So we just take our body. Now this, so we consider this body as the self. You identify me as this self. So we use a conventional term, I, you, he, she. This is a conventional term. 
It says that this is my dress. Right, yeah? So we take it this body as I and uh, me, okay? This is me. So body as processing the self. So when we say self, uh, that means when something is yourself, you this belongs to me, I have absolute control over it. It is your house. You have absolute control over it. You can paint whatever colors you like. If you have a self, you can do anything to it. If it belongs to you, it, you can do anything. But the body, is it yours? It is part of nature. It gets old and it gets diseased. It gets old and diseased, you cannot control. It aging and is uh, having disease and dying or having COVID. So you have no absolute control. So it's actually not yours. It's just working, processing as part of nature. You think it's yours, right? Then that is the body because we think this body as self. And we are very attached to this body. We can't detach from this body. So we consider this body as the self. So similarly, we consider these aggregates, this, this self, this body. If you have this sense of self or the soul, you have this sense of self, then you think these five aggregates are in the self. So the aggregates are in the self. It's just like you are a jar. The container in the, or a sponge. Okay, let's say a sponge. You see you are like a sponge. Huh? The substance is like a sponge. Then you think that the self is in the sponge, like soak up in the sponge. So it feels very integrated. So the sense that there is a self in the body. So it's like a sponge. Huh? You think that the self is in the aggregates. But there's no water in the sponge. So this is the aggregates as self and aggregates in self. So this in reverse, huh? if you think that there is self, this self has all these things or this self is in all these things. So these two are so integrated together, you cannot sort of tease them out. And so because we cannot tease them out, we become very engaged with the eight residues of life. My name is very important. My fame is very important. My, the gains that I'm going to get. I must have these gains. Make whatever great again, you know. And I must have my pleasures. I must have my whatever to, to delight my eyes, my nose, my tongue, my ears, my body, my mind. But the body is going to decay and die. Right? And the consciousness also will decay and die. So the five aggregates, the Buddha says, the body is foam. If you look properly at it, you look, he tells, as the Ganges River comes down. He says, uh, this foam you see in the river Ganges is like your body. It changes, 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 changes. It's called rupati. It is deformed. And the feelings that you have, he says, is like a bubble, a raindrop that touch the surface and then it's over. Perception is like a mirage. The mental formations is like a banana tree trunk. 
is nothing substantial inside. And consciousness is a magician. So he says that these five aggregates, see them as they are, know them as they are, they are empty. So to see them, uh, so all this is just concept. Concept as aggregates as self, as in self, all these are, you know, just even I explain to you, okay, there's an inkling, but then this has to be experienced through this practice that you are constantly in the present looking at your mind and body, looking at your five aggregates, looking at the six sense bases. So we have a heart sutra that tells you the five aggregates are empty, the consciousness is empty, it is empty, it arises and ceases, none of them stays. If none of them stays, he says, if you are present, present and know that it ceases. So when we have, we have this legacy of a mind and a body, the body will die one day. If you are constantly in practice, then when the body dies, when the flame goes off and you do not delight in others, then the consciousness also dies. So then there will be complete release where you don't, then you do not go. You do not go for another impermanent thing in any existence because all things are impermanent. You do not, you won't yearn and fall onto any aggregates, any perceptions. You just know it ends, it ends. There is no more fuel or oil anywhere that you delight in and uh, sort of land. If you see them as impermanent, why you heal them? You won't heal them. You won't bother about them. So when it ends, it ends. So then there will be no rebirth to suffering. If you do not see the danger in samsara, then you will get taints. Uh, you will think that sense pleasures are permanent. But it's temporary. So, and that views, uh, you quarrel over views, you clash, you fight. And then thinking of becoming. So all these are taints. If you see it in the every arising and ceasing, then it doesn't, it doesn't have any substance at all. So, he tells us, uh, the five aggregates of clinging uh, are fortunate for us that it is impermanent. If they are permanent, uh, we are done for, we will be suffering. So, we can to see, to see for yourself, to know for yourself, these are impermanent. There isn't anything. I isn't. There isn't anything at all. So, thank you, Doctor. Yes. This fortunate attachment is very difficult to maintain. Do you have any tips on how to be mindful of the present and not be attached to the past or future? Another question in a similar line is, how do we have the energy to exert uh, on this fortunate attachment? So the Buddha always tells us, uh, in addition to the Four Noble Truths, there are three cases. So there are three cases uh, so they are all together, three plus four, seven. And he always tells us, you have to look at gratification. And you have to see the danger. Then you will look for the escape. So one fortunate attachment, you have to ask yourself, keep in mind this. When you gratify yourself 
with the sense pleasures, with the views of your six sense bases. If you gratify yourself, do you suffer? The danger is all these sense pleasures and all these views are impermanent. Why do you want to hold on to things that are impermanent? The danger of being caught up in this gratification is that you will have endless woes, endless suffering. You will have endless suffering if you are not going. Now we have this uh, stay home thing, right? And you never train your mind. So you feel uh, claustrophobic. You, you feel uh, that you are being hemmed in. And so there are a lot more domestic violence. Because they are untrained. They want to go out to gratify themselves. But if you know that there are dangers out there when you gratify yourself, you will not go. So you must see the danger in the gratifications. If you don't see the danger in the gratifications of your pleasures, of your views, or of your becoming, then you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to escape. Only when you see the danger, then you will escape. You escape how? He says the path. He told you that the Noble Eightfold Path. You have to keep in mind the right understanding. Every act you do, will it cause suffering? I'm going to go there for this. Is it worth it to go there for this? Can you do without this? So you see, we have this uh, COVID-19, right? It is how you see uh, COVID-19. So COVID-19, why all these problems uh, come about? Uh, because of cravings and clinging. It will overwhelm you. Craving, clinging uh, will overwhelm you. You will lose your vision and your insight to the Dharma. Because craving and clinging overwhelms, you cannot see. But it's 2019, that is the past. So we have COVID-20. Okay, uh, COVID-20. So what is COVID-20? COVID-20 is containment. If you are content with your essentials, or you are very generous, so there is contentment, generosity, etc., etc., virtues. So contentment will overcome your suffering. You are content, you are content in the present. You are waiting out for your vaccine. They may tell you partial opening, etc., but if you think that it is still unsafe, then there must be contentment in your practice. So it will overcome and you will have the vision and insight into the Dharma. And this is 2020. It's not in the past, it's in the present. So you have to practice how to be content, how to be satisfied with your essentials. That you don't go and contaminate, no? How do you stay simple? So this is a lesson. If you want to go back to 19, then there's a lot of this. There's a lot of suffering. You are now in 20, so you have to learn contentment. Contentment will overcome your, your all the residues in life will give you the insight into the Dharma. So this is the practice. So we are now here. 
So we have to do what is essential. It tells you, this COVID tells you, don't go to the future. You may be overwhelmed by this. You stay present. This is the present. So you, the practice uh, is not hard. It's just simple livelihood. It's to be kind to yourself. If you can't be kind to yourself, if you want this and that, then you're actually being cruel to yourself. So you must have the right understanding and the right thoughts foremost in your mind. Because this will lead to the right understanding, the right view will lead to your intentions. But he tells you again and again, renounce that sense pleasures. Renounce where places, no, where there is so many people. We are ignorant whether another has. So if you crave and cling for those pleasures, then you will have a higher chance of, you know, becoming sort of caught up in suffering. So we have to need energy to uh, exert ourselves how to exert yourself? Exert for yourself means every day you wake up from the time you are awake, when you notice all these activities. So you get up, you know you're getting up, you're going to the toilet, you are going to do your business. All this you can see arising, ending, arising, ending. Even you reflect now, last yesterday. From the morning you get up from your bed, the posture has been changing whatever you're doing. Posture change, activities change. Then he says, uh, of course, we get enticed or we get pulled and pushed by our pleasant feelings and unpleasant feelings. So I would like you to go and read uh, MN152, how to develop your faculties. And he says, your faculties uh, to develop. Of course, we want to be in the present, but we sort of like being pulled and pushed. So then he says, if you are pull and push, just blink your eye. You know, it tells us, blink your eye. So it change. And then if you smell something, it's just like a, <laughs> just a nose discharge, pew, a mucus drop. And then if it is a tongue, then he said it's like a spit. Whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, just take it as a spit. Right. And if it's the ears, uh, it is the sound is unpleasant. Uh, then you, like a snap of your finger, just discard it. And then he says the thoughts. He says that uh, your thoughts are uh, drop those thoughts uh, like a few water drops onto a heated hot pan. So you can imagine now uh, if you cook, uh, you know when it's very hot, you just like see how hot it is. You just drop one or two and then it's like evaporated. So he says, uh, you must practice your five faculties like that. Anytime you see something you don't like or you like, just blink your eyes. If you like, if somebody say anything, just snap your finger. You don't like, snap, this is gone. This is just a sound. So smell, uh, oh, it's very smelly. So it's just like, <laughs> just a nasal discharge, right? And the uh, tongue uh, is delightful or whatever, it's just a spit. So this is how he tells us what to do. So in, that's why I encourage you all to read the suttas, because although it may be very worthy, uh, you just pick out the essential. What is he trying to tell us? us? So that's the gem. That's why they say triple gem. The gem in the suttas the gem in the Dharma, you have to go and look for the gem yourself. So then it can become, through the practice, gets integrated. So it is the triple gems. The Buddha is the one who taught us all this so that with the Dharma, there is no suffering. Right? The Dharma, he asked us, let the Dharma be your refuge. Let yourself be the refuge. He says you have to See this, 
No one will save you, you know? only you save yourself through your own practice. So you be the refuge for yourself, let the Dharma be the refuge for you. This is what he says in the suttas. And the Sangha, the Sangha is there and you rejoice in their practice. And that, you know, all this, the Buddha and all this Arya Sangha, they are the examples. They are the inspiration of what is possible for yourself too. They are human beings, you are a human being. So they, you just, it doesn't, as long as you're a human being, the Buddha says there is a potential for realization. It just needs the moment of clarity through the practice. Thank you, Dr. Ng. There's another question. Please share and describe your experience in separating the mind and awareness. Entering into emptiness is revealing the true I. Okay. So, the Buddha says, uh, uh, when you discuss something, there is five ways of discussing or teaching. So, everything uh, he tells everything uh, he tells us uh, what to do as a person who gives the discourse. So in this particular discourse, I forgot this, uh, the sutta name, but he tells when you discourse, there are five things. The five things he says, uh, you must discourse something that is gradual, analytical, out of compassion, not for monetary gains and then no illusion no illusion uh, to yourself or others so this question said from your experience so we do not say my experience so we say, uh, so this is alluding to myself. So the Buddha says, uh, when you see things as impermanent, so you say, what are impermanent? So you see the clouds in the sky. It's impermanent, right? Well, so one day there is the clouds, and then after that, uh, after the rains, there is no clouds, it's the blue sky. There is nothing, no clouds there anymore. There is no thing there. So the Buddha asks us to see uh, these things. The rainbow is just uh, sort of the lights uh, being sort of refracted. So you have to see it. You have to see it for yourself that there is no thing. Uh, can tell you uh, and you can listen for a long, long time, day in, day out. Uh, the Dharma has to be realized by oneself. No amount of, of having uh, you know, another person's experience. It doesn't matter. The person is realized, it's that person who is realized. You have to realize yourself. You have to see this, uh, the five aggregates as a sixth sense base, as impermanent. This is what he has been telling us that the characteristics of the Dharma, you have to see for yourself by being mindful in the moment of the body, of the feelings, of the perceptions, of the mental formations, of the consciousness, of the mind object, of the mind and mind object, that they are impermanent, that they are of no substance. And you have to see it for yourself. So once you see it for yourself, and it is through this practice again and again. Then you see for yourself that there is no thing. So it's nothing. It's void of the self. So this, this entering into the non-self is the perceptions. So we have these perceptions. These perceptions. So there are 10 perceptions that the Buddha taught us right, in Girima Nanda Sutta. 
And of the important perception is the perception of impermanence. Only when you have a memory of something you have seen, then it can become a perception. But if you have, cannot see it uh, as impermanent, there is no perception of it as impermanent. So only after you see it as impermanent, then you can have that perception of impermanence. So you have this contact, and then you have perception, feeling, mental formation and consciousness. You have to see it for yourself. So, we, so he tells us to use perception. So although he says perception is a mirage, but after your practice, uh, then you see uh, that all the, you can see the conditions as impermanent, that everything you see, you see mindfully and clear comprehension. And this clear comprehension is clearly comprehending that it is impermanent that there is no substance in it. Only after you perceive, then you can be clearly comprehensive. So the first thing is you have to perceive. Your mind must be quiet enough to perceive. So after that, when you perceive that, it will come very naturally to perceive the non-substance. Because the characteristics of impermanence is non-substance. When a thing is impermanent, there's no substance in it. So when you see it, uh, there's no substance, then there is a perception of dispassion, a turning away. These perceptions are naturally, are natural. So you have to practice, and it's only practice after you see it. You see it for yourself, so the insight of things as impermanent then you will see at every moment all things as impermanent. So when it's all things are impermanent, there is nothing there to hold on. So this is what it means, nothing to hold on. So there's nothing to hold on, you are free. You are a free person. You are free from your five aggregates. So then it's just released. So this is Sunata. So Sunata, so you say a cup, is it empty or is it full of oxygen? So Sunata is empty but full of bliss. So it is that the, the practice will yield, you know, because the Buddha says if you practice, you put in the effort, you will be able to see. Thank you, Dr. Ng. We have a few more questions. One is, if consciousness ends together with the end of the physical body, so is there no rebirth? Because this contradicts Buddhism, which believes in rebirth. Appreciate your clarification. Rebirth, the dependent origination, uh, rebirth takes place uh, only when there is ignorance. So there's no contradiction to what the Buddha taught. The Buddha taught very clearly that ignorance will bring about the intentions, ignorant intentions, and then the, will drive the consciousness to do ignorant things, to crave and cling for becoming and above the whole lot of suffering. So when it ends, when the person has no desire or delight anywhere, it ends, uh, and that when it ends, then there is no rebirth. It tells of intentions and karma. If there is still intentions, then there are cravings. Only when there is no more cravings, then there is no rebirth. So it tells very clearly that consciousness will end uh, and that there is no rebirth. So the Buddha will say, okay, Vakali has passed on. Vakali has passed on and that uh, there is a dark smoke, you know, going north, going south, going east, going to west. 
looking for the consciousness of Vakali. But you see, Vakali has realized you cannot see the consciousness of the Vakali who lands. So Mara cannot see the landing of the consciousness because it has ended. So when you have delight, Mara is with you. Right. So it's no contradiction at all. The Buddha says the five aggregates arise and cease. It is ignorance and craving that drives us through samsara again and again. So uh, it doesn't contradict. You, if you read the suttas, it reinforces. It says, arise and cease. All conditioned things arise and cease. So what goes up will come down. There's nothing substantial in it. Thank you, Dr. Ng. I'll combine two questions together. Um, if we should abandon the past, then why do we study history? And another question is, the past sometimes makes us what we are today or a better person and not to repeat mm -hmm. the same mistake. Sure. So now, this past here is not to be delighting. So this past here is do not cling. You are not clinging. Do you know what is clinging? This is clinging. You know, you're holding tight to your past. I am such a person. I have such accolades, etc., etc. I am such and such in the past. So when you hold on to this, uh, you are on the high up there. So pride comes before a fall, right? Huh? So you might just tumble down. So the past, we say, sir, that the past, we learn our mistakes and we move on, right? Huh? So the past, and we learn a lot of, uh, and all these suttas are from historical preservation, from initially oral transmission. So without the history, so there would be not have this Dharma. This history of collection of the Dharma. So history preserved. The sasana is uh, there. Nature is there. The truth of nature will persist. What arises and cease is nature. So the past is not to cling on to the past. The past has gone. This is the delight. This is the delight that we say. that you spend time thinking, thinking, thinking of the past. Instead of spending the time to see your thoughts as impermanent. If you delight in it, eh, and you think too much, they call papancha, you'll get yourself a headache. Or you say that the past is like that. And it is the past, eh, Again and again, uh, you have certain karmic tendencies. Uh, again and again, you follow the same route that you take because you have these tendencies. So it's important uh, to be able to be discerning. You have to put this foremost, foremost as in the present, the pro presently practicing. So I think, uh, and we respect the past. We respect the past, we respect our ancestors. We respect all those who are, all this, you know, the Buddha, the Aryan Sangha that has gone in the past. So it, the past that we do not want uh, is the mud, the things. So we learn to practice so this is the past practice that we want. Not the clinging, not the attachment, 
to people and things in our life uh, too hard that we suffer and they may suffer too. So this is to be in the middle path. We have to be in the middle path. If we get too attached to people, things, then it is going to be suffering. You can see things arise and cease. This is its nature. So we are by, like clouds in the sky. Can we attach to each other? We can only be clouds passing by. It's a nature. We cannot think of the previously there was a thunderstorm, etc., etc. It's gone. We are but just clouds in a clear blue sky. So it's just when and when it's gone, the clouds disperse, it's dispersed, finished. Is this uh, is there Thank a second you. question? <laughs> uh, Thank you, Doctor. Mm, we will take two last questions. What is the purpose of our existence as a living being? And how can we eliminate the thoughts about myself and others? That is what is the same purpose person. of the existence? So the human existence is to find the truth. So the meaningful part of life is to see the truth. So the Buddha asks you to put in the effort to see the truth. If you don't put in the effort, you cannot see the truth, then you come back to the same problems that you have not, the same mistakes you may make because you have not given up those. So you come back again and again. Like your mistakes, sir, you never sort of correct. So this life you have to learn again because you haven't another life to learn again because this life you haven't learned the mistakes so this this uh this life uh, is to know your mistakes your tendencies and how to purify so the buddha says avoid evil do good purify your mind so this is what you need to do for your life because we have a human existence that is precious. Because in this human existence, we can see suffering and then we want to get out of suffering. In the divinity, in the Deva world, uh, it's so fine. There's hardly any suffering. So the Devas, when they are passing away, will be exalted by Devas to be reborn in the human realm so that they can hear the Dharma and practice for the end of suffering. So the Devas also want to be reborn as a human life to realize the Dharma. So this is uh, important, the meaning of existence, full use of your current existence, cut off your defilements, to purify yourself over do good. Otherwise, you have to take rebirth again and again. So, it is important to practice. Is that answer the question? Yes, thank you, Dr. Ng. We shall just end with someone sharing. Thank you very much, Dr. Ng, for the powerful reminder on the impermanence of five aggregates. At an pleasurable moment, I am now with my family. I am fully contented and present in this happy moment. I no longer regret the past when I was not enough time with them and also not expecting more of such moments because the future is now. Thank you so much, Dr. Ng, for a beautiful sharing today on one fortunate attachment.
Thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining us in this uh, session. We would like to end with sharing of merits to all sentient beings. Eta vata cha amhehi sampatam punya sampatam sabe deva anumodantu sabe sampati siddhya Eta vata cha amhehi sampatam punya sampatam sabe butta anumodantu Saba Sampati Siddhya Eta Vata Cha Amhehi Sampatam Punya Sampatam Sabe Satta Anumodantu Saba Sampati Siddhya Let's share merits with our departed relatives and friends. Idame nyati dam hotu sukita hontu nyata yo Idame nyati dam hotu sukita hontu nyata yo Idame nyati dam hotu sukita hontu nyata yo Closing homage let us pay homage to the triple gem Arahan Sama Sambudo Bhagawa Buddha Bhagawantam Aviva Demi Swakato Bhagawata Damo Daman Namasami Supatipan Bhagavato San Vakasan Ho Angam Namami Pa Sadu Sadu Sadu, sadu.